We are now at over 21 participants, but I think we'll go ahead. Each speaker has um, half an hour. If you leave time yourself for questions, that's fine. If you don't, then please answer any questions that appear in the chat. All of the papers have a sort of a common theme about analytics and surveys and student experience. And our first speaker is going to be Percy Ndunge from the Val University of Technology on the analysis of the, the BUSTI survey. Is race and gender associated with student experiences and expectations at the Val University of Technology? So, um, Percy, if you would like to go ahead, um, you can take over the screen, um, share your slides, whatever. Uh, thank you. Uh, may I just get confirmation uh, if colleagues can see my screen? Um, yes, I can see it perfectly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so thank you once again, colleagues, uh, for attending this session. Um, as said, uh, the title of my paper, my working paper, is um, Analysis of Busi Survey. Uh, and the question I was asking is race and gender associated with student experiences and expectations at the VAR University of Technology. Uh, maybe to begin, uh, I would like to say a little bit about what is my rationale for this study. So what is making me or what uh, wants me to actually do this study? Uh, well, I make the argument that in the field of student development and students engagement, respect and appreciation, uh, and appreciation for diversity is not enough. Um, what I say is needed rather is an understanding of how that diversity regulates students engagement or students learning behaviors in order for us to be able to develop effective or responsive interventions in order to enhance student success. And so that's the, the in a nutshell the rationale for why this particular study. Um, as an introduction, I thought I'd use uh, three questions to help uh, uh, sort of frame uh, this presentation today. So the first question uh, that we ask is why student engagement? So why the particular interest or use of student engagement data? Well, uh, student engagement is of interest in educational settings uh, because research has shown that engaged students tend to be good students. Uh, and not only that, uh, those students uh, it seems over time then become better students. And so there is evidence to show that uh, engaged students over time become better students. Um, and scholars have also argued for student engagement servers in their data to inform uh, a culture of evidence to guide decision-making in higher education institutions in order for us to be able to improve learning uh, and student success. Uh, and then maybe finally, universities uh, may utilize student engagement results in order to help them to design interventions for more effective uh, learning environments. And so um, I think in these three bullet points, I tried to answer the question of why use student engagement data. Um, Okay, let's see if it moves on to the next slide. So the second question is, uh, what is student engagement, right? So I've spoken about why we should be using student engagement data, but what is student engagement? Um, so student engagement is a concept that has gradually evolved over time uh, from decades of research that's related to number one, the influence of student behavior, and secondly, institutional practices uh, on student learning. Uh, put a little bit differently, uh, here we see Men's uh, definition of uh, student engagement as number one, what students do, which is the time and the energy that they devote to educational and purposive uh, activities. Uh, and secondly, what institutions do or the extent to which universities employ effective educational practices to promote student participation. And so that is what uh, student engagement is about. And then the third and final question is, uh, what does research tell us about race, gender, and student engagement? So um, is there literature that has looked at the relationship between race, gender, and student engagement? And if, if such uh, literature exists, uh, what does it tell us, right? So uh, the first thing here to note is that very few studies exploring the relationship between race, gender, and student engagement have been done in South Africa. Um, through my own research, I only found two such studies that looked particularly at the relationship between race, gender, and student uh, engagement. So not even more than three studies have been conducted that has looked at this particular relationship. 
uh, in the South African context. Um, there's only one publicly available study that looked at these at this relationship here that used Buse uh, survey data, and that was the PhD study by Mens in 2012 uh, from UFS. Um, and I think uh, when I was reading her PhD, uh, I was excited to, she confirmed my findings that there's actually no studies that have been done in this particular area, because in her PhD she says, um, no studies related to the psychometric properties of data obtained from Buse have been conducted to date in South Africa. And she said this in 2012. Uh, and 10 years later, in 2022, we find that still uh, no such uh, studies have been conducted in South Africa. Or if they have been conducted, uh, they obviously have not been published or made uh, uh, available in the public uh, academia uh, platforms. So. Uh, there are studies that have been done in other contexts uh, that do or, or that use student engagement data. So, for example, in the United States, a lot of research has been done using student engagement in Canada, in Malaysia, and other parts of the world where they've used student engagement. So what have those studies revealed about the relationship between race, gender, and student engagement? Well, research examining the relationship between gender, race, and student engagement at post-secondary level has provided mixed results. So uh, there's been nothing very conclusive to say uh, this kind of relationship exists in this particular way. It seems that uh, findings differ according to different contexts, but also according to different institutions. Uh, and part of the reason why the, the result or the findings might be uh, uh, mixed is probably because of the type of uh, survey instrument that is used to measure student engagement at the different institutions. So different surveys would probably uh, find different things, right, uh, when it comes to this relationship. And I think an example of this is, um, I said that there are only two studies that have been done in South Africa that looked at the relationship between race, gender, and student engagement. The one was the one, uh, the PhD by uh, um, uh, Mens in 2012 at UFS. And then another study was conducted at NMU um, by two American um, uh, scholars. Uh, and there, they didn't use Bose data. So they created their own survey to test this relationship between race, gender, and student engagement. And so you can see a different survey instrument being used there. Uh, but they also did find that race and gender were found to be related to student participation in co-curricular activities and students' sense of belonging to the university. So that is a finding that is very local to South Africa. Um, and yeah, so those are the three questions. So a little bit more about uh, my research methodology for this particular study. Well, uh, this is an exploratory study. Uh, it's uh, one of many firsts, right? So it's the first of this kind of study to be done at this particular institution, but it's also the first in the country that does this particular kind of analysis. Whilst the two studies that I mentioned in my previous slides also looked at the relationship, they conducted a different analysis because they used uh, scales to be able to assess this relationship, where in my current study, I use individual uh, measures of student engagement to be able to assess this relationship. So what was the research question guiding my study? Um, I asked the question, is race and gender associated with any first year student experiences or expectations? Um, this was a quantitative study uh, in that I used quantitative data and used quantitative uh, uh, data analysis uh, methods. Uh, the study was largely inductive, and part of the reason why the study is inductive, like I said, was because they are, there, is, there was nothing for me to measure or to, um, uh, to frame my study with, uh, with existing liter literature in South Africa. So I was starting from scratch, uh, which was also uh, sort of nice in a sense because uh, I was new to this data set. I'd never worked with this data set. I'm working with secondary data. I did not collect this, uh, this data. I did not design this survey. So it was good for me to sort of work from uh, from the bottom up and see what comes out from this data. So I started with observation, I received the data, and I had to sit with the data, sort of understand the questions that were being asked these students, see what kind of data uh, was being generated through these uh, uh, through, the, uh, through the responses and what kind of variables were there, was it ordinal, categorical, um, and so that I can be able to see what kind of analysis I could be able to do. Um, and then obviously after uh, going through this, uh, understanding the survey and seeing what was there, I had to start to observe what patterns were coming out. And so Certainly race and gender was something that started to uh, emerge as uh, uh, emerge more uh, compared to other uh, relationships, right? Uh, and then obviously I made my hypothesis then uh, starting to see if uh, race and gender would be associated with any other of the student experiences and expectations in the data set. 
Uh, and then finally, I, I make general conclusions based on what I found here. I'm not able to yet theorize any of these findings because like I said, uh, there's just far too little data in South Africa uh, that has done this kind of analysis for me to be able to say, well, we can begin the process of theorizing what these findings mean. All right, a little bit about the data that, I, uh, that I'm working with. Um, like I said, I used the beginning university survey of student engagement from the Val University of Technology, which was administered in 2017 uh, by the University of the Free State. Um, the survey was administered on a representative sample of first year students across, um, I say five campuses, uh, that number might be wrong, but it was across all the campuses uh, at VUT at that time in 2017. Uh, the students completed the survey online and the, inter, uh, and the invitation for them to complete the survey was, uh, communi was communicated to them via Blackboard. Uh, the initial data set that I received from UFS had uh, a total of 364 cases and about 130 variables in total. Uh, after cleaning the data and processing the data to uh, remove cases uh, where there was missing uh, data, uh, I was only left with about 306 responses from the survey, which is what I conducted my analysis on. Uh, so tests of association were conducted on 83 of the student expectations and experiences uh, within that data set. So I counted about 83 variables that measured student experience and student expectations. And by student experiences here, we are referring to students' experiences in high school. And when it comes to student expectations, we were talking about expectations of the engagement at university in their first year of study. So meaning, uh, meaningful significant results were only observed between 10 uh, of the 80, sorry, it's supposed to be 83 variables uh, from the data set that identify or that measured student experiences and expectations. Uh, so this study reports on only those 10 uh, variables from this data set that reported significant uh, associations. So institutional ethical clearance was obtained through the University of the, uh, well, through the Val University of Technology for me to be able to uh, conduct this um, study here. And then the statistical software package data 13, version 13, uh, is what I used to conduct my analysis. All right, so about some of the findings from the study. So what first year student experiences and expectations were associated with race within this particular group of uh, first year students? Um, just to uh, note colleagues, uh, the Val University of Technology has a very low rate of diversity when it comes to race. Uh, when it comes to race. Um, the latest data that I had indicated that about 1% of our student population is white and 1% of our student population is colored uh, with about 98% of the students being black at our university. And so um, this sort of posed a challenge for me uh, into, in terms of how to test for this analysis because of the skewness or the um, uh, sparseness of the distribution of this data when I was looking at the data set. Um, and so um, I will talk a little bit more of what or how I uh, overcame that problem. I think even with a low number of uh, white and colored students uh, in, on our campus, uh, I did not want to not do this um, analysis uh, or to exclude race uh, as a variable here because we still need to understand uh, the impact of race even within the minority uh, racial groups on our campuses. So race was associated with only three out of the 83 variables. Uh, and so if you look at that picture that I've used here for race, uh, this is not our campus, unfortunately. So if these students look familiar, they might be from your campus because I had to borrow this picture from uh, somewhere else since we don't have uh, really that representative, uh, racially representative campus. Um, so one the first uh, a, a variable that was associated with race was how certain students were that they would find additional information for subject assignments when they did not understand the material. Uh, so you will see on the tables here that this was uh, unequally distributed on the six point scale. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more what uh, or how we, we understand uh, this particular table. And you can see the distribution according to the different, uh, according to the different racial groups. So what are we seeing on this table? What is this uh, table, uh, um, this uh, graph uh, showing us? So we see that 42% of students here indicated that they were very certain uh, that they would go the extra mile in finding information uh, for assignments when they did not understand. But looked at particularly uh, on the racial lens, uh, we see on that rectangle, the red rectangle there, that about 100% of white students were certain that they would find additional information for assignments compared to about 43% of the Black uh, African counterparts. 
Uh, and if you look at that uh, second uh, red, uh, rectangle there, you see that 100% of college students indicated that they were not certain at all of going the extra mile to find information when they did not understand for assignments. Uh, so I conducted a Fisher's uh, uh, exact test because that is what is recommended for data that is so sparsely distributed. Uh, and this returned a p-value of 0 0.001. Uh, and so therefore we rejected the, the null hypothesis here uh, to conclude that racial identity and how certain students were that they would find additional information for subject assignments when they did not understand uh, were associated. So the first relationship between race uh, and students' expectations at university here. And then the second question that was uh, positively associated with uh, race was when students were asked how certain they were that they would participate in subject discussions even when they did not feel like it. And then again, we saw that this was uh, unevenly distributed on this particular graph here. Uh, and then what is this uh, telling us? So what, do, what are we seeing from this graph? So we see that 25% of the students rated this a five. Uh, on the six point scale, 20% of them said they were very certain uh, that they would participate in subject discussions, whilst 4% rated as uh, uh, a one or not certain at all that they would participate. So if we look by, a, a com make a comparison in terms of race, we see in that red uh, rectangle that 20% of black students said that they were very certain of participating in discussions, even if they did not feel like it, compared to 100% of white students who were prepared uh, for these discussions. Uh, on the other hand, we see that colored students, once again, 100% uh, colored students indicating that they were not at all certain that they would participate uh, in classroom discussions compared to 3% of Black African students. Uh, again, uh, a Fisher's uh, exact test was conducted to test the strength of this relationship uh, and returned a p-value of 0 .05, uh, 0 0.049, which is close to the alpha of 0 0.05. However, we still rejected the null hypothesis here to conclude that racial identity and how certain students are that they would uh, that they would participate in subject discussions even when they did not feel like it uh, were positive or were associated and then finally the last variable that was associated with race was when students were asked how prepared uh, students were to analyze numerical and statistical information here we saw once again uh, the distributions uh, very une uh, unequally distributed throughout um, the graph here uh, so what is this particular graph showing us? We see that 34% of students indicated that they were six uh, or very prepared on this uh, six point scale to, uh, uh, to analyze numerical and statistical information. Only 1% uh, said that they were not prepared at all. Um, and we see uh, the, red uh, the red triangle there, that 35% of black African students compared to 100% of the colored students said that they were very prepared. And so we see that colored student, uh, students in this particular sample, although uh, stating that they are very prepared for analyzing uh, uh, numerical and statistical information, however, they are not willing to participate in classroom discussions for some reason, or to go the extra mile to find information that they don't understand. In the second red, uh, red triangle, we see that 100% of uh, white students compared to just 5% of black Africans uh, rate, rated themselves a two on this scale, uh, which indicated a very low level of preparedness. And so a Fisher's P test as well was done, uh, sorry, a Fisher's exact test was done and it returned a p-value of 0 0.032, uh, where we then had to reject the null hypothesis and concluded that racial identity and how prepared students were to analyze numerical and statistical information were associated. So now we look at what first-year student experiences and expectations were associated with race. So seven out of 83 um, of these student experiences and expectations were associated with uh, race. So let's look, I'm not gonna report on all seven colleagues, I'm only gonna touch on three, uh, and then I will move on to my discussion. So how often, uh, one, the first variable that I, I would like to talk about was when students were asked, how often did they expect to discuss topics or concepts with the lecturer outside of class? Uh, we saw that the distributions between men and women uh, differed across uh, the graph here. Um, and so what are we observing here? We see that uh, majority of the students or 43% of the students answered that sometimes uh, that they would be willing to discuss topics with uh, lecturers outside of the classroom. Uh, those who answered very often were about 18%, whilst 12% said that they never expect to discuss subject topics with a lecturer outside of the class. Uh, and what we see in that red triangle, the second red triangle there, we see that 21% uh, 
uh, male students expected to discuss subject topics with their lecturers outside class very often compared to just 12 percent of the female students. So we're starting to see these differences between male and female students' expectations uh, to engage with lecturers. So here we were able to conduct a Pearson chi square test uh, and it returned a p-value of 0 0.016. And so here we were able to reject the null hypothesis and then conclude the uh, concluded that gender identity and how often uh, students expected to, uh, to discuss topics or concepts with their lectures outside of class uh, were associated or related. Another one that I'd like to talk about is how certain students are that they will find additional information for subject assignments when they do not understand. When they were asked this question, uh, we saw again that the answers varied uh, uh, according to gender. Uh, uh, within the students' responses. And so what are we observing or what patterns are we observing here? Well, we see that 53% uh, of female students compared to 33% of male students were very certain of going the extra mile. So we're seeing uh, female students here showing more willing, willingness to go the extra mile to find additional information compared to their male counterparts. Uh, we conducted a Pearson's chi-square test again to test uh, this relationship and returned a p-value of 0.007. Uh, we then therefore rejected the null hypothesis to conclude that gender identity uh, and how certain students were that they would find additional information for subject assignments when they did not, uh, when they did not understand uh, was positively associated. Um, maybe I'm not going to talk a little, um, uh, more about this one, colleagues, uh, because of time. I want to move on to my next slide, which will look at... Um, uh, which will look at the discussion or how uh, I summarize these findings or what they are telling us. So uh, more to, towards the discussion, right? So what is this data telling you? What is the value or what is the uh, essence of this data, right? So the first thing that I think uh, I want to mention is that initial observations of the data reveals that there's not a single instant in which the responses were distributed equally across the various scales used in the survey. And what this tells us is that race and gender in many ways shaped the kinds of experiences and expectations this group of first year students had. Uh, and I think a major finding of the study is that race and gender are statistically associated with only 10 out of the 83 of student experiences and expectations from Busa uh, survey. However, this finding needs further testing, right? So uh, in the form of replication studies. So you, VUT needs to conduct more of these studies uh, from different samples to see if we would find the same uh, findings. Uh, and when we've conducted those studies, we can then compare our own findings at our institutions to see what are in other institutions institutions finding, what are the variables that they are finding associated with, uh, with gender and race. Um, right, so more specifically about race, um, the study found that uh, compared to Black African, 57 percentage more white students would find additional information for subject assignments when they did not understand the material. Uh, or that we found that in another example, uh, compared to black students, 79.73 percentage point more white students were very certain that they would participate regularly in subject discussions, even when they did not feel like it. Uh, and then finally, when it came to race, colored students had a low level of preparedness for analyzing American statistical information with 100% rating themselves a two on the six point uh, scale. And then when it came to race, oh, sorry, when it came to gender, findings from the current study show varying levels of engagement between female and male, uh, and male students. Uh, on whether students would find additional information for subject assignments when they did not understand the material, compared to males, 19.9 percentage more female students said that they were very certain of going the extra mile to find information. Uh, female students were 17.49 percentage point more very prepared to write clearly and effectively than male students. And then finally, uh, on the other hand, we found that male students reported higher expected uh, levels of engagement with their lecturers or university staff compared to um, their female counterparts. Um, and so my concluding thoughts, colleagues, uh, so what uh, did I find any utility in this, uh, uh, in this uh, instrument or this survey? Well, I think uh, there's definitely a lot of value in it. Uh, this kind of data that came out of this particular study uh, could be useful for me as a tutor coordinator, right, um, uh, when I do my tutor training. So I can share these findings with the tutors and we can discuss them to say, now, look, this is what data is telling us about the first year students that you'll be tutoring. How do you think you would uh, uh, address these particular uh, uh, findings from the study? What does this mean for you as a tutor? But it also has uh, utility, for example, uh, we met uh, with the FYE 
uh, uh, team and then they're developing a booklet that they're willing to share with uh, first year lecturers. And so what we said is that in the introduction of that booklet, they would use findings from this particular uh, survey to help them sort of uh, as an introduction to say, hey, this is what data is telling us about first year students on our campus. Um, so there's certainly some, uh, some value uh, from this particular data. Uh, there's also potential utility for this data for academic advising. So academic advisors might use this uh, because they interact with faculties. They, they can direct the uh, faculty to say, hey, look, this is what data is telling us about first year students. So within your faculty, what are you, uh, what are you, what are you going to do? What in interventions would you put in place to be able to respond to this data here? Um, what I say, uh, what I, what I, what I, what I argue for in the end is that we need to compare findings across different samples within the same institution. So I need to, we need to conduct, uh, to re replicate the study again at UFS. Now compare 2017 data with another year, right, to see if the findings will be the same. Um, and then I make a call for similar studies to be uh, conducted from different institutions. If different institutions conduct similar uh, sort of analysis on their data, that would allow us to move on to the next part, which is then where we move to comparative studies across institutions. And once we get to the point of those comparative studies with other institutions, is only then we'll be able to begin to theorize these observed patterns to see uh, what they are telling us about first year students expectations and experiences uh, and thank you colleagues that's where i'll stop um thank you um percy we have a number of questions in the um chat and three minutes in which to answer some of them so the ones we don't get around to if you could um just have a look in the chat yourself and answer them the first one is given the racial distribution, how did you downsample your data to conduct the analysis? Um, all right, so I sorry, I was just noting the question about um, about class as well. So maybe let me start uh, with the question about class. Uh, my okay. the 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 study that I'm rep, uh, rep, the paper that I'm reporting on now only reports on race and gender, but when I started the, 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 my analysis, I actually conducted my analysis on all other students' uh, biographical information. So I did look at things like whether a student is a first-generation student uh, at university, if that would be associated with any student experiences. And I thought I was going to find uh, a lot of uh, uh, association there. And I found only one variable, for example, was associated with that. Uh, in Bose, I don't think there's a particular question that looks at the issue of students' uh, uh, socioeconomic status. So it wasn't possible for me to do that kind of analysis. So that's the response. Uh, I think there was uh, Oliver who asked that question. And so it does, um, OK, so there was a question about racial distribution. Given the racial distribution, how did you downsample your data to conduct the analysis? So I wasn't here. So I only started working at BUT in 2022, unfortunately. And this was conducted in the, the, the data was collected in 2017. So I'm not sure what was the process uh, or how they ensured that the, the, the sample that was collected was representative. But I think from uh, what I've uh, learned so far, is that students volunteer to take this survey. They don't really um, identify students individually to come participate in. Okay, and there was one other about after cleaning your data, you lost about 60 data entries. How did mm -hmm. you account for that loss of data? Um, that's something that's very common with uh, when you're working with quantitative data, unfortunately. So when students complete a survey or when people complete a survey, sometimes they miss other questions, sometimes they don't want to answer certain questions. And so to be consistent with analysis, uh, you we tend to not include uh, observations where there's missing data so that we can get a true representative uh, sample. So uh, although it sounds like 60 is a lot, uh, it's not a lot because we still had 300, right, which allows us, which statistically allows us to be able to carry out the analysis that I was doing. Okay, thank you. That looks like we're at the end of our time, but you'll see also in the chat, I asked Free State if they did a, they normally do an institutional report and a national report. Um, you might be able to use a national report to compare with your report. And, and see what data points are similar because there are other institutions who are using the same um, form. So Percy, thank you very much. And we can then move on to our second paper, 
this time from the University of the Free State. It's automating tutorial attendance register capturing pre preliminary results from a pilot project. And it's Nzmeni and Mofo King are the two presenters. Who is going to present um, both of you or one of you? Um, good day, colleagues. We will be presenting together. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Good day, colleagues, once again. Um, my name is Mosa Mofuking, and I will be co-presenting with Mr. Sivuili <laughs> Nzimeni. I am the research assistant at the ASTEP in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences in, at the University of the Free State. We will be discussing the topic centered around the automation of tutorial attendance register capturing, as well as discussing the preliminary results from a pilot project. We will start with a brief introduction of what we do. We will also consider the context of our work, introduce the problem, which is the tutorial attendance capturing at scale, how we attempted to address the problem and initial results. Finally, we conclude with a way forward. A step in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences has been operating since 2008, 14 years of tutorial services. The period has been marked by rapid growth. For example, in 2008, we had a handful of modules throughout the semester. As of 2022, we have 44 modules in the program. For example, a num number of tutors have increased significantly in 2018 from 30 to 62 in 2022. Naturally, this led to a need to innovate how we conduct our business. In recent years, we have changed the status of tutors from ad hoc employees to contract employees of the university. This has many advantages, including greater access to university resources, more predict predictable income among others. And similarly, how we conduct training has also fundamentally changed to account for the large cohort. Our lecturer pool has also increased in line with module numbers. Furthermore, all these changes mandate process innovation. In this presentation, we'll share one such process enhancements we, an enhancement we have recently concluded. Currently, the model of register capturing involves or rather includes the following steps. Ideally, or Yes, ideally a tutorial session is facilitated by the tutor. Thereafter, they have to deliver the signed attendance registers to the office where an intern or a student assistant captures the register on PeopleSoft. In turn, the data is stored on a database. The main problem is the time consuming nature of the overall process. It is also human intensive error prune and time consuming. To address the problem, we saw it fit to involve the human side of the issue. Communication platforms that we currently use include WhatsApp and emails to communicate with the team. We have a main WhatsApp group that consists of 80 tutors along with two sub WhatsApp groups that mainly include module groups or rather what we call module groups. Basically that's where we allocate or divide the tutors evenly according to their modules, as well as the team leaders um, module groups that are mainly centered around the team leaders um, selected by the tutors in the module groups. Ultimately, these groups are created for purposes of daily announcements and reminders. Our alternative communication platform is also making use of emails, but we've come to realize that with the academic commitments and other factors identified by the tutors, we have a considerable number of tutors who do not have time to check their emails. Hence, we nudge or rather remind them using the um, WhatsApp platform for important announcements. 
amongst very um, various benefits that we have identified by means of making use of the identified communication platforms. The first one of which we consider important is that the a virtual environment is basically promoted through the WhatsApp uh, platform as it fosters interactions and collaboration with stakeholders. Stakeholders being tutors themselves, the research assistant and the teaching and learning coordinator. Secondly, a united community is established since knowledge sharing is promoted and achieved. Basically, we see this in the respective module groups where there's constant um, engagement amongst the tutors about the content that the lecturer normally provides for the tutors to facilitate during their sessions. Furthermore, a key affordance of WhatsApp is its flexibility to interact without time and space constraints. Basically, our tutors have better control of balancing their work and academic activities. For example, you would see, or rather, when we do communicate with our tutors in the main group, you would see that after the announcement, approximately 30 tutors have already read and um, acknowledged the announcement within an hour. So it goes to show the level of responsiveness from the tutors and the professional uh, working environment that's uh, um, actively promoted. Lastly, using WhatsApp and emails as an engagement platform has also served as a powerful educational tool to encourage second interaction among the tutors. Having said all of this, colleagues, it's, it's very important to also note that incorporating the communication platforms in our pilot project was fundamentally um, important in uh, um, making sure that the project itself is a success. So I'll discuss the findings of the pilot project initiated. All right, thank you very much, Musa. <clears throat> now for this presentation, I just want to go back to this part of the problem. Uh, the first part I want to clarify here is the process of fa um, facilitating a tutorial session is where the tutor really gets to shine. And then the second part where they have to drop off a tutorial session um, register is where um, some of the admin starts to kick in. Now, that process it has been fine for a number of years, but as Musa mentioned, we have to constantly find ways of improving how we do our business. And this is one example of this. So our primary goal here was eliminating the need for our student assistants and interns to spend the vast majority of their 40 hour work week on capturing registers. And this in turn um, enables us to give them leeway to find new creative ways of addressing problems within the tutorial program, finding more innovative ways of improving our processes, and just generally um, using more of their skill set as uh, postgraduate students um, to assist us in the tutorial program. So here we are highlighting the fact that um, this process previously has been human intensive and moving forward, it's not um, sustainable as it's costly both from the university side and from um, um, the student assistants and interns um, time in, in the sense of their contribution to the tutorial program. Now, in order to address this, we started investigating uh, ways of uh, taking these handwritten um, attendance registers and then converting them into machine readable data. That is data suitable for a database. Now, when one looks at the literature, this is a problem that's been widely investigated in the computer sciences. Uh, there are packages out there, open source packages that try to address this problem. Uh, the most notable among these are technologies um, and packages in both Python and R that use uh, what we call optical character recognition. That is perfect for reading um, uh, computer written text, that is something that's written on a computer. Um, but when we start going into uh, handwritten uh, text, it becomes slightly more complicated. This is where um, deep learning algorithms start to really shine. So when in our investigation, we found uh, CNN, which are convolutional neural networks 
Um, RNNs, uh, also a form of neural networks. I'll try and reduce the nomenclature, but it's important just to highlight in terms of um, the steps that we took. These, are, these algorithms really shine in terms of being able to extract this data. Now, with this knowledge, there are two approaches one could take. The first is to build a system from scratch. Um, that is, uh, get the training data, um, annotate that training data, build a uh, deep learning uh, model, evaluate that deep learning model, and iterate through the parameters until you reach a satisfactory level. The other alternative is to work through what we call uh, software as a service. Now, there are numerous service providers in this regard and secondary um, service providers. Uh, the three most not noteworthy are the sort of what I call the big three, that is Google Cloud, um, Microsoft Azure, and um, I believe it's AWS. They all have um, computer vision APIs that one could use. Now, in our case, we went with Google Vision for a couple of reasons. Uh, their documentation is very clear on their GDPR compliance. That is important for us um, as GDPR is almost analogous to Popia. It was also very simple to set up and do the implementation and the cost of doing this exercise was zero. So that's also a very appealing part. For those of you who are more technically inclined, are interested in the, um, the code and so on, I've put an example of the main function that we use, but to summarize it for everyone else, what we're doing here is basically telling uh, Python, go to this directory and pull the data from the 2nd of June, uh, 2022. And thereafter take the image annotated for us and return a file to us that we can use to extract the student numbers. That's essentially, broadly speaking, what we're doing here. Now, this has an important um, implication for our work here. The first big implication is, as you can see, we can actually access rather advanced technology with a few lines of code. Secondly, this script is not unique to me. It's actually in the um, Google uh, setup documentation. So it's really, as I mentioned earlier, quite easy to set up and run. Now, going back to our usual flow of how we do things, working through Musa's uh, communication and working with the team, this year we started to turn things around. The first one is you still have the tutor going to the tutorial session. You still have them running to our office to file their um, attendance registers, but there's a second step involved. So in order for us to encourage on-time reporting on tutorials and to monitor how um, attendance is going week on week, day on day, we asked the tutors to take a picture of the register and upload it on Questback. Now that has another advantage associated with it in that we have a digital database or rather we have a database with all the images of the registers already. So we don't need to scan them um, for purposes of processing. And secondly, we also help, this also helps with reporting. So in order for us to get uh, day on day attendance trends, week on week attendance trends, the tutors are already summarizing some of this work and they are sharing that input. And the reporting line in terms of um, summarizing attendance trends is much faster that way. Another advantage of doing this is we can access um, the Questback uh, server to retrieve these images, download them into our local computer if necessary um, as, a secondary, as a secondary backup and to do our processing. Here we relied on two programming languages. The first is Python, the second is R. R we use primarily for downloading and pre-processing of the images and writing out a per K file that we called in the earlier code I shared with you. And then we use uh, Python for accessing the Google Cloud, um, obtaining the um, JSON result, and then converting it again to a par K file. Now, the reason why we use par K file here is it's less, um, we have less, uh, the best way to put it is we use less space on our disk on our computer. So it's less, um, we compress the size of the file. And then the second step is essentially running the code. Now, the human intervention here, um, I'll say in the results, is significantly less and significantly less tedious than previously. And that's the problem we were trying to solve in the first place. And then finally, 
Um, when we use our, uh, we export the data to a CSV format in line with our uh, ERP, uh, PeopleSoft to be specific, um, and then upload that into the same database as before. Another part our, I'd like to share with you in our channel is that the physical copies, so the actual attendance registers, we file them and then we scan them and we store them again as another means of backing up. This is important um, for two reasons. One, we don't have attendance registers floating around campus. And secondly, we have a secondary data set that you can use to generate um, the, to use these scripts against. So if we need to do um, training, further training, if we need to check for accuracy and so on, we have this secondary data set. Now let's get down to the results. Uh, we processed through 1,200 pages uh, to date. We still have some registers that we still need to process, but these um, yielded approximately 15,000 records that uh, just to be clear, that's not individual students, that's students going into a tutorial session. On average, we have um, 5,300 students. So those are returning on a rate of three or so times to tutorial sessions. As I mentioned earlier, having the online submission also help, helps streamline reporting so that we can give on-time feedback when it's required on a weekly basis um, to our managers. And then the, the last part, and I think the most important part is the human time. Now, Musa, who works with me as a research assistant, has had to capture zero registers. And I think that's an important part because when Musa is not working on registers every day, she is able to uh, communicate with tutors on, uh, on um, WhatsApp. We are able to collaborate on projects such as uh, presenting at Siapu Malela. We are able to find new ways of doing work. Uh, for example, later in, in the week, we we're gonna have our first uh, faculty's tutor conference. So these sort of initiatives and creative um, initiatives would not be possible if we were dedicating this time to solving these things. Now, what's next for us? I think the first one is we need to evaluate whether we should scale these to other faculties. Is it worthwhile to do so? I would argue it is. And the primary, the primary reason for having that statement is um, from a cost perspective, it's very low. From a benefits perspective in the sense of freeing up uh, student assistance time, it's also um, very beneficial. And we are able to dedicate more resources at refining other processes um, in the tutorial program. Furthermore, we might need to look at um, investing time to building some of these um, uh, algorithms ourselves and models ourselves so that we are able to have a paper trail. Say a student inquires, what do you do with my data? Currently, we, we are accessing a model from one of the big three and we are <clears throat> yielding the results and capturing them. But it would be good from an ethical standpoint to say to a student, this is how we train the model. These are the parameters that we um, used in order to derive at that model. And this is how you can investigate for your specific case, how um, the data was used to de develop that model. So that is it from our end. We now uh, are going to dedicate time to questions from the group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it was absolutely fascinating, and especially that you're able to do this at absolutely no cost. I'm sure everyone's impressed with that. I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, anybody who would like to ask a question, if they could raise their hand. Our presenters have kindly left us about 10 minutes for questions. There's one now, I think from Ivan. How long does the process take? Okay, so <clears throat> I like that. Thank you for giving me that easy one, if, Evan. Um, so the process takes about 20 minutes. So we did two runs in the semester. The first batch we did for the first couple of months of the tutorial session, um, that took 17 minutes um, of my time. So I, this was very important to me that um, members of the support team don't have to spend time on this. Um, it took 17 minutes to do about um, I think the first run we did 8,000 records, 
And then for the second round, we did, we had a similar time around 15 minutes or so. So I just averaged that out to 40 minutes. Um, the whole uh, script, the script, the script I showed you earlier, let me just navigate back to it. Uh, here we go. So this particular part, so this is sort of the, when we, the action gets to take place, that takes about 17 minutes to run. That's very impressive. <laughs> the questions, comments? Yes, I see there's a comment from Evan. Um, I think <clears throat> as we increase student support in all institutions, not just in our instance, um, as we increase student support initiatives, you are going to find that, um, so we need to put the backdrop of um, funding restrictions from the government side and the implications for the um, um, higher education sector, we are going to need to find alternative ways of doing our work faster and better and also keeping um, our costs down. And I think the best way of using this limit, the limited resources that are available is towards doing, um, um, doing the actual work, i.e. Um, increasing the number of tutors, increasing the number of advisors and so forth. So I just wanted to get the conversation going. Uh, Musa and I wanted to get the conversation going about um, focusing on how we make our processes efficient for the future, essentially. Thank you. We have another question in the chat. Do you have to clean the results? Very minimally. Um, so what we do to clean the results is use regular expressions. Um, our student numbers at the University of the Free State follow a specific sequence, so it's quite easy to do that. Um, and that's basically extracting those student numbers from the JSON file. Now, in the pre-processing we do, we make sure to link each tutorial session to a, uh, the staff number of the tutor and the module of where this tutorial session happened along with the date. So that makes it much easier to combine the data into um, a suitable format. Okay, hey, um, we have now a couple of questions here. In terms of the support team you mentioned, what are the costs thereof and what costs are saved through this? And then where so, are the um, and Yes, so in terms of the uh, cost of the support team, most of them are hired at student assistant, intern and um, research assistant level. So from a cost perspective, it's not um, uh, groundbreaking, it's not going to break the budget of the university, but I think um, if you are hiring students at postgraduate level, expecting them to do internship, I think it's incumbent on us to provide, to make sure that the tasks that they fulfill in their role are worthwhile. And by that, rather than sitting and capturing each and every line of the attendance register, we talk about um, uh, the interns, student assistants, and research such as assistants looking at, is our evaluations processes um, effective? Is there a way we can optimize them? Is there a way we can optimize our observations and so forth? So I think that's where the, the crux of the benefit is for an institution. Um, I just want to look okay, at the great. other question. Yeah. Which yeah, system no. do you use to evaluate the effectiveness of the tutorship program? Uh, we, we store our data. So I just want to go over the statistical net analysis we do for the effectiveness of the tutorial program. So the data we get from the attendance registers is aggregated at a level, depending on the type of results we want to look at. So at the end of the semester, what we do is take all the attendees from our database, um, aggregate them at the number of attendance, uh, uh, the number of tutorial sessions that they've attended, and then try to look at the relationship between attendance and their final mark. And then we do uh, usually non-parametric version of um, uh, ANOVA, where I think that's the Chris Wallace test, where we compare the differences between the two um, and uh, between the two groups, those who attend more frequently and those that don't attend as frequently, and we report on that. Um, I hope that answers the question in terms of which system we use to evaluate the program. Um, I okay, see then we have another question about differences between faculties when it comes to how they capture um, tutorial attendance and does Free State have this challenge? 
Yes, um, we definitely do. So in, in the University of the Free State, we have um, tutorial programs at varying scales. So the, if we take the example of economic and management sciences, we have been, uh, ASTEP has been in the uh, faculty for 14 years. Naturally, that means we have more uh, modules in the tutorial programs, while in others, the establishment of ASTEP um, has been more recent. As a result, uh, let's say we take the example of economic and management sciences and faculty two. Faculty two has less um, modules, therefore they have less registers to capture, but we still have that uh, problem that we referred to in our earlier slide of somebody needed to sit there and capture registers. And that takes quite a number of time. So we're talking about months of capturing that go into the thousands of student numbers. So I think deploying something like this across faculties would have the end result of freeing up capacity, making sure that the resources um, that we have are really focused at how do we improve, how do we increase our reach as a student support program as well. Thank you. Um, I think Esther, this is the man to talk to um, if you're thinking of investing. And then if we take one last question, because we're running out of time, who usually gets access to the registers and how is access granted? Yes, so in terms of the tutorial program, we have a structure where we call uh, people in the faculties, teaching and learning coordinators. We have access to that data. Our direct um, line managers also have access to that data. Um, and we use that primarily for reporting. And I think the, the prime advantage of it is on a week by week basis, we are able to pull data. Um, I think the most important thing thus far is we used the resources we currently have in order for us to um, build the systems. I think the electronic submission has been uh, the most valuable from what I've looked at in our pilot project, because we are able to do um, to pull data far more frequently and with less um, administrative burdens associated with it. And that's simply using um, uh, a survey platform that is already um, licensed to the university. Well, Sivayile and Musa, thank you both very much for what I found to be a fascinating presentation. Um, we can now move on to um, the next session, although I see there's a last comment, would you share your, your contacts so that people could in fact contact you um, to learn more about what you were doing? Yeah. Okay, the uh, next presentation Wendy, is also uh, the unit. Yes. Francois, Francois had a, a hand up earlier. I don't know if he still wants to say something. Oh, I beg your pardon, Francois, I didn't see your hand. No problem, Wendy, good to see you again. I'm covered, thank you. Thank you okay. very much. I see you, you've put a comment in the chat to say that um, they've done very good work, uh, which I agree with completely. Mm. Okay, so um, also University of the Free State enhancing data management and academic advising through a learner case management system to optimize student support. And this Gugu Tiro Yobane and Rowan Posthumous um, if one or the other of you who's going to start the presentation would like to load your presentation. Um, is it on the screen perhaps, Che? Good morning. Yes, hello, Google. Yes, it is, but it's your entire set of slides. It's not in slide mode. All right. It's not in screen um, presentation mode. Let me do this then. PowerPoint. There we go. Is it better? Okay. No, you've still got all your little slides across the bottom. The bottom. Yes. Um. Um, Wendy, Gugu, Riashna here. We had this problem in the last session I was in. Apparently, Zoom doesn't do so well with presenter mode. Uh, okay. Gugu, can I suggest that you make the left-hand side very small and also take away the notes bar? Notes? No. Yeah. Okay. Swap displays? There we go. 
Now oh, that's it. Thank you very much. That will do just perfectly. Thank you, Google, yeah. if you'd like to start. Thank you so much. So good morning, colleagues. I'll just put my camera on for a split second that you see me. But for the interest of data connectivity, I will just keep my camera off and have myself unmuted. Thank you for joining our presentation this morning titled Enhancing Data Management and Academic Advising. And this is all in an effort of optimizing student support and referral. Um, and this is a University of the Free State case. This is not an academic paper, but rather a reflective practitioner's piece. I will do an opening uh, uh, spiel and then Ruan will follow on in the middle and I will come back at the end of the presentation. So in terms of what, just to place our presentation and position it in, in our practice, um, academic advising in South Africa through various initiatives has become a, a, a formalized practice that has been defined and through the work of the National Academic Advising Association based in South Africa, we've come to define academic advising as a teaching and learning practice, as a practice that helps students align their personal academic and career goals, shared responsibility between students and the institution, the promotion of a meaningful academic experience, the establishment of a sense of belonging, but most importantly, enabling student success. And through having such um, a definition, and I think throughout the conference and in other conferences, we have had ref heard reflections um, from institutional pieces that advising matters for various reasons, but ultimately to place it in the context of this, uh, this presentation, um, I actually want to highlight that for us and the, the data management component, advising matters because it assists students in selecting, changing, adding or cancelling their modules. And this is a part of uh, information that is critical in ensuring that a student stays the course and reaches graduation. It helps advisors and the institution, as well as students, monitor uh, progress. And this is from a, academic, an academic lens. We've heard how institutions have used learning, learning management systems to do this, grade centers, grade books, to, to collate data that students are able to, to track their academic progress. But also it matters because it offers students a better connection with the faculty, the institution at large, and really join them to the critical student support services. We've seen in our own space that students sometimes don't reach um, for the counseling service or are or are too vulnerable to even try and get to any service, even if they're not in trouble. Um, we've seen how students shy away from going to services like career services that just help them with CV writing, not even academically related um, a component for first and second year students, but rather a developmental co-curricular initiative. Um, but also advising matters in that it gives students the ability to navigate the university policies and procedures much better. Now, with that said, um, we also uh, have, have looked at what is the secret ingredient, and I think it's pretty obvious from what you see on the screen at the moment, but what has really ensured that we piece together all the data points that matter most for a student is reflecting on the student journey. And we've identified six phases through which a student moves through where data is critical. And for us, the record keeping in each of these phases um, is what has become of uttermost importance for us. We're at a recruitment stage, although it's not formal data capturing, but once a student captures their application, looking at what their first, second, third choices are are and what it translates to in terms of their registration is also telling in terms of how you support the student as they transition or as they progress towards completion. In some instances, we have noted that a student entered with a higher certificate uh, in theology and religion at recruitment. 
um, they, they, their entry and admission then resulted them in transferring to a higher certificate in the humanities. So from what they were recruited for or what they indicated they interested in to their entry and admission, there was a data change. At registration, the number of credits that they register for, um, for the higher certificate in theology or the higher certificate in the humanities. And as they transition, are, are they completing the right number of credits and how that information is all collated onto one space or enabled that it is collated and brought together into one space to ultimately enable completion or graduation, as some of us might refer. So in terms of what further research is talking to why uh, record keeping or data management matters in academic advising, Webb actually articulates that academic record keeping is a less glamorous visible duty of academic advising. And for those of us that are in the practice, you would note that sometimes it is a tedious exercise to try and capture the students um, but it uh, behaviors and as they move, but it is of critical importance. Uh, it is that it is the responsibility of the advisors to ensure the accuracy and the quality of of information because it creates the bigger holistic picture that can afford us an opportunity to better support or sustain the student in the system. In terms of where in this context we place uh, the data management and academic advising in the types of record keeping, we've identified that there are different types of records that are captured of the student. And this also lends itself to what I spoke to earlier in understanding the student journey. So we see that there are behavioral records, there are performance records, there are attendance records. But for the purposes of the work that we have been doing, we've looked at placing the learner case management at the intersection of this Venn diagram and placing the learner case management in a space that is unique, that brings both, that brings together the performance records, attendance records, and behavioral records, so that support and a bigger picture and an understanding of the student is established. That is, in essence, the and lever to enable the support that is positioned for the students. Furthermore, in terms of looking at uh, the records and the importance thereof in the context of academic advising, we have found, and Ruan will speak a bit about the hows and what we've done, and I'll then come back to bring a case study of bringing this into practice. But we've found that the importance of uh, record keeping lends itself to promoting data-informed decisions, not only for the academic advising office, but for the wider institutional community that serves serves the students. It guides design because in the narratives, you are pulling together the story of the student, you're gathering the gist of where the student is, and then it affords for holistic, responsive, and supportive in, in, uh, approaches. Again, not only from an academic advising lens, but from a holistic student support lens. I will now hand over to Ruan, who will take us through some data management considerations, give us examples of data management processes, and most importantly, then looking at actual data we found, and I will then come in from a specific context where we present to you how we've taken all of this into a global context. Ruan, over to you. Um, thank you for that introduction, Gugu. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so one of the exciting um, parts for me about academic advising and specifically academic advising with technology is that it is an unseeming or a seemingly unusual marriage between a stu the student's experience and zeros and ones of computers. So um, if you're anything like Gugu, for example, you want to look a student in the eyes um, when you have a conversation with them. But if you're anything like me, you find yourself having conversations with pivot tables um, or graphs. And the thing is, or the beauty is that when you really want to scale um, advising, you have to integrate the best of these two um, worlds. And that is why speaking about data management and advising in the same presentation is so um, vitally important. 
Now, data management, um, if I may oversimplify it, because it's a, it's a huge field in and of itself, um, is where you, it's the practice where you, you collect data, you organize that data for, for internal use, you protect that data, if you think now a little bit about Popia and things like that, and you store that data for later research with the intention that uh, we can analyze this data to make high quality um, decisions. Um, but as COVID has come along, um, the, the consumption rate or, or, or how much people use data um, has really increased at rapid rates. Um, so it's even more essential now for looking at the data management than, than ever before. And this is really where we find the value in, in the learner case management um, system. So Google, if you can go to the next slide, I want to uh, give you a, a, a screenshot of one of our slides that I that I use when we train academic advisors. And my question for them is, um, do you think this quality, this data that you see here in front of you is, is high quality data? Um, because it's unreasonable to expect academic advisors to handle all of the data management um, on top of the other responsibilities that they have. So there's a few core concepts that, that I just want to bring over to you um, with this illustration. Um, so um, this is actually a screenshot of data that, that we had in 2019. And you'll see the, the data is blurred for, for personal uh, just to protect personal identifiable um, information. So um, if you paid attention and you hopefully noticed that there's quite a lot of issues on that, that slide, you'll see things like there's inconsistent naming uh, conventions. For example, you have black, uh, African, black with a small letter, black with a capital letter, and, and computers are really uh, really stupid, uh, they can't think for themselves. So, so they see that as, as different entities. Um, and that really just makes uh, data standardization so valuable that when we use definitions, that we and the computer use the same definitions. And you also see there's some missing values at the top. Um, you'll see there's a lot of zeros, which makes it incredible difficult to integrate this data set um, with the rest of your institution's data set. If you don't, for example, have a student number, this data set will then um, float on, on its own uh, somewhere on somebody's computer. Um, and if you're a data analyst, you, you'll also notice that this is in Excel. And that's one of the reasons you cry in the shower at night. Uh, because uh, you have hundreds and millions of versions of, of, of Excel files floating around when, when uh, we share data via email. So um, luckily for us, this isn't uh, where we are now, but this is where we started in, in 2019. In, in statistics, there's a, a saying that they say, uh, garbage in, garbage out. And that just emphasizes that um, you, you, you can only make high quality data driven decisions when you have high quality um, data. So Google, you can go to the next slide for me. Um, so as I said, luckily for us, um, we started a, a process of standardization and integration where we did a cleanup exercise with our advisor um, and just training them giving them enough information that they would understand what would impact um, a learner case management system without going into the, the nitty gritties um, of data management itself. So the biggest return on investment um, of these data management um, uh, or of data management is that it, we can use it to make informed decisions. So I want to share uh, a few things with you, um, but before I do that, or a few graphs with you, but before I do that, I just want to explain this high tech, high touch concept that we have. Um, because 
advisors have interactions with students and they capture these data sets that we can use and our way of approaching the data sets um, will definitely impact um, the way that we draw conclusions from from these data sets so um, two core technologies that we use is the, the text analytics our advisors also captures a narrative in the a learner case management system that's that's not a standardized field but that's a, a open field where you can just fill in what whatever you would like to fill in um, and then we mine those narratives for insights and then the other parts of the the um, learner case management system has standardized drop down a menu you know where you just select your various items and that makes it easy for us to quickly pull data um, and have real-time counts of what's going on where. And then for that's the high-tech part that I'll dive into in a moment. But then the touch would be how does this feed back into the advising um, um, loop? So in the next slide, you will see that um, it looks like a very complicated graph um, if you just look at it like that. But this um, is the session themes that we capture. So if if somebody goes into C Advisor, um, Advisor will 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 give that theme a, a name or purpose. For example, a student comes in for application information. Then that session theme would be application information. Um, and that's also a drop down menu where you can then, uh, according to the advising practice, choose a, a specific theme for, for students. Now, the reason why this is very useful for us is Google mentioned earlier that we have this life cycle that a student is going through. And we took these themes as an example and plotted them. Um, at the bottom, you'll see it's, it's by month as an example where we plot these themes by month, you can actually see when students are asking um, or are interacting with advising for, uh, for what specific um, theme. So you'll see these themes earlier in the year that's very prominent, that fades away later in the year. Um, but then, for example, in September, you see that they already start asking questions about registration information and so on. So you, you can get a feel for when do we need to, to engage with our students and, and when do they need what information. So um, graphs like this is, is, is very easy to, to pull when, when everything is a, a little bit more standardized. Then on a second um, slide, you'll see that um, Okay, so we know when we should interact with students or when do they need what information, but then um, we use text analytics in the narratives just to, to get the why. Um, why are students speaking to um, academic advisors? And as I said, that narrative is, is very rich in description because the advisor can can type anything they want. And um, now how our text analytics work is it's not only doing a word count where you um, just see which words are, are, are mentioned most and then you know you use that as our theme, but um, our text analytics actually goes and and look at key phrases that tends to to co-occur uh, or, or group together. Um, in certain contexts. And that kind of gives us an idea of, of what students are speaking about in, in which contexts. And by following this, um, uh, you know, co-occurrence of, of words, we can, can do very rapid screening and then we can, we can respond very quickly. So in a disruptive environment like Kwakwa, uh, we can pull data and within a few seconds or in a few minutes, we have a good idea of, of um, where are we going um, in terms of the, the next intervention. So 
that brings me to the the touch side of the high tech high touch um, concept and the question is in sometimes unfortunately we are constrained with our capacity and we can't reach everybody um so we then use analytics to um, decide who should we reach first we, we want to reach everybody but who should we reach first um, and that's when we start to to integrate these uh, types of data sets um, uh, with the rest of the institution's data sets and we can really start to identify the most at risk students as an example um, on the slide you'll see these different flags this was one of our um, initiatives where we try to to see who needs uh, uh, help first and you'll see at the bottom there was students that triggered up to eight nine um, uh, uh, risk flags that that concerns us and those were the students we targeted first with um, with our interventions and our support and then you go up from there starting with the most vulnerable students um, to the least vulnerable students. Um, and I'll, I'll give over to, to Gugu to take it from here. Thanks, Ruan. So colleagues, you would have heard the overview I've given you about academic advising. Ruan took you through some data management and I want to take you now a little deeper into how we put this intentional data management strategy into practice at on our Gwagwa campus. Now, for those of you who do not know, our Gwagwa campus is one of our three campuses. It was previously the, the uh, Uniqua and in 2003 became part of the University of the Free State. So in essence, that campus is about 19 years old. We service about 8,000 students across four faculties. Now, for those of you that do have been keeping up with what is happening in the news, there have been a lot of environmental disruptions that uh, students were faced with, not just students at the University of the Free State, but the community surrounding uh, our Gwagwa campus, and that is Malutia Pofung. There have been many local protests taking place part and parcel to the COVID pandemic. So students first couldn't access campus because of the pandemic, but then when the protests hit at the, at the beginning of this year, it prohibited students uh, from accessing campus. There was some arson on our campus. There were political influences affecting everything. Now, in light of those disruptions, this affected the academic program. Now, in terms of how we support and how we thought about supporting the students, Ruan spoke about how sometimes we limited um, to capacity in terms of capacity. And with only two central academic advisors and three success coaches working in what we call, you would have seen on the slides, GPS, which is our graduation positioning support, we needed to look at our data management our data points and how we could optimize use those to optimize the support we offer the students once again from a remote context so again borrowing from the lessons we learned during the pandemic we again applied indicators to identify students um, with specific uh, risks. So if a student, for instance, was not on the learner case management system, plus um, not, not living or registered to be living on campus, we could have considered that student as a priority student in our, in our space. So in terms of, of offering that blended holistic support, GPS is, is what we then used as the main lever. There was in the identification, telephonic outreach to students based on the indicators and the ranking of the indicators, the students' cases or narratives or engagements with either their advisors or the success coaches were captured on the learner case management system. And from there, they were either supported or referred then to the next service that would offer them that intentional support. So what the learner case management narratives afforded is that they afforded us scaling of direct support, whether it be individual or group, because the referral was now being moved, not by paper or having the student to phone around and move from one person to another, but rather more intentionally moving of, of, of students. However, like any other system, there were challenges. The data accuracy, uh, the availability of students on their cellular devices, some of them even not having updated numbers on the system. And of course, 
with the context that they were confronted by the connectivity and device compatibility of students was another challenge that these students found. In terms of the data that was captured on the learner case management system, you will see here that in this instance, we identified four flags. And um, in the four flags, these were distributed amongst the four faculties. But you can see that two approaches were applied here. The students that were least priority were sent SMS nudges, which were encouraging messages. But the students deemed to be the most priority students received an individualized call to get that support. Once again, the narrative was captured um, in the in the and the text and, and the analytics was run on the narratives of the students. I don't know, Ruan, if there's anything you want to add here, but you can see here that in terms of the students and what they were mentioning is, you know, the face-to-face -face component, access to Blackboard were some of their challenges. But some students leaning to the data accuracy were only registered for one module, yet we identified them. Trial and error, but we've taken lessons that data accuracy is of utmost importance in a data management system, particularly for advising. Ruan, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. Uh, Gugu, you've got five minutes, please. Noted. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Gugu, on that note, I think, um, I think uh, you can just continue the presentation. Fantastic, thank you. So just to summarize how we, we use data management in GPS um, for the Gogo campus, we really looked at both qualitative and quantitative data. We identified the students. There was an outreach via our GPS. There was the capturing, and most importantly, there was an action that could either inform scale design or then offer a responsive support for the student. So in closing, we just want to highlight that data management in academic advising again helps you improve student support it helps streamline communication between relevant stakeholders um, it eliminates the hassle of paperwork it is indeed time saving it affords better analytics and a more responsive uh, uh, design it enables to dec inform decision making and it increases the productivity and efficiency of academic advisors we just want to close off by giving some heads up or tips for those considering where to start but fortunately the teething pains have been felt by the University of the Free State and the University of the Pretoria because IDSC now has simplified the system and has a ready learner case management system but we would encourage that co colleagues would or institutions would need to have all student support stakeholders around the same table to even try um, having a data management um, system that affords or enables student success. You need to streamline referral processes. You need to capacitate, Ruan spoke about training staff. You need to cap capacitate the staff that works with students. You need to identify the critical data fields to be collated, both quant qualitative and quantitative. And then in that, you also need to consider the ethical considerations thereof, which includes POPIA, affordability and accessibility and the IDSC learner case management system is quite affordable. So in conclusion, a learner case management system is very important because it holds the potential to strengthen and integrate the role of academic advisors and support institutional objectives. It assists with systematic recording of process and enables access to the necessary information at the touch of a fingertip. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gugu and Ron. Um, I must say, although they're using it at UP, this is the most insight I have gained into the um, functionality of the system. And it looks like it's something which um, works well. And certainly it's, it's um, providing help to the most vulnerable. Um, as you said, there are a couple of questions in the um, chat, which I would ask you please to um, answer in the chat because it's coming up to the next presentation. But thank you again very much. Very impressive work being done um, again. Okay, our final paper for this session is SASE 3.0, New Insights on Student Engagement. And here we have Francois Stradum, Sonia Lertz, and Hanni Posthumus. Um, I don't know who's going to be presenting first, but if you would like to load your presentation. 
Um, okay, so, so in 2020, it was the first year since the, the previous revision of the SASE that we did not do a national administration of the survey. Um, so we decided to get uh, the, the sector together or the network together to revise the surveys, all, all of them, um, and also just to check in with what, what are some of the pressing issues that we need to gather data on on a national um, platform. So we had about 14 institutions, we had the council, we had DHEAD, we had Yusuf and Sadie, um, and we all got together in 2020 to revise the surveys. Um, we, de we concluded to add four topical modules, academic advising, experiences with writing, inclusiveness and decoloniality, and learning with technology. And we also added two items um, as part of high impact practices for institutions who want to scale up entrepreneurship and mental health. Um, so institutions got a chance. There were about 10 institutions participating in the administration at the end of last year. And we had over 14,000 students responses and institutions could choose two of these four topical modules just to keep the, the length of the survey also um, in check. So what we're sharing here today is just touching on some of the key findings that are coming from these four um, topical modules, as well as the two um, newly introduced uh, high impact practice items. Um, and just to pause and reflect for a bit on what, what are the implications of these data points for us as the Siapumalela network and our institutions. So in terms of academic advising, we had six institutions participating. Um, and this is just to show you a benchmark in terms of how many students saying that since, you, since they've been at the institutions, how many of them have had academic advising. Um, and you'll see this ranges from 75% at some institutions down to 63%. But in, in all in all, about two thirds of students say, yes, I have had um, academic advising. Then we asked between, or we split it between first years and seniors. So about two thirds of first years say that, yes, I've had academic advising and about 70% of senior students. So when we talk about senior students, these are students who are still undergrad, but just not in their first year. So second year and up. So it do, there does seem to be an increase in terms of whether um, students make use of academic advising more in their senior years than in the first year. Then, for the students who have not made use of academic advising yet, we asked them why. So we added a bit of a qualitative um, element to, to understand why students are not participating in advising. And some of the responses are just um, added here as an ex as example. So while the administration took place at the end of last year, we still had about 60% of the sample that were still studying online or, or primarily blended. So this is an example of a student saying, um, almost everything is online and it's very impersonal, so I don't know who to talk to. Um, students commenting on the administrative procedures. So it takes long, this, it's a long procedure just to get to an academic advisor. There were quite a lot of students saying that I just haven't had responses to my emails. I've sent emails, but no one responds to my email. Um, then we've had students saying that I, I don't need academic advising. So the student was saying specifically that they refer to the rule book of the faculty. So th they don't need, they don't necessarily need someone to sit with and talk to about academic advising. Um, and then the last one there is important um, uh, for us to consider in terms of whose responsibility is it? Is it the responsibility of the student to reach out to us or is it our responsibility to reach out to students? Um, and the student was saying, I think it's mainly because I have not asked for any advice at this institution. So who are students talking to in terms of academic advising? So you'll see on the left, um, uh, this is a differentiation between also first years and seniors. So for the most part, um, first year students seem to be talking to their friends or other students, um, which is a bit concerning because of the sample of over 14,000 students, 77% um, of them are first generation students. So if almost 70% of students in their first year are talking to their fellow students who are primarily also first generation students, then there's not a lot of good information going around to guide them. Um, about half of students, of first year students say that they, so they speak to academic advisors, but you can see the big increase then in terms of senior students making more use of um, academic advisors in faculties. 
um, which might be for four different reasons. It might be that they suddenly become aware of, of the, the service that is there um, that they might not have known about in the first year, or it might just be, as you'll see later, that students are, are, are starting to rethink their options um, and then they change, uh, they change courses and so forth. So in terms of senior students, we've got about uh, uh, two thirds of them saying, yes, I, I talk to friends. Um, and about 63% saying, saying that they do talk to academic advisors. Um, about half of the, of the first year students also said that they do talk to family members as well. And as you can see this, um, there's also some students um, going to websites or making use of online services, or if, if it is relevant at their institution, making use of advisors in, in support units as well. So who are students talking about their career plans or career interests? Um, again, family members and other students come out top. So about 71% of first year students say that they do talk to family members about their career plans. Again, keeping in mind that 77% of the sample are first generation students. In other words, they're talking to parents um, or family members that might not have gone through university and might not, um, might not have completed degree courses um, and which links to career um, options. So again, um, the senior students talking a little bit um, more to other students in this case, but they also, the senior students talk a bit more to professionals or people in the field. It might be because it, it, it is included more in the curriculum to bring in a bit more um, people from the outside to come and, come and engage with students. Um, only about 20% of students, whether they're first year or senior, talk to academic advisors um, about career interests. In other words, there's still a bit of a gap between the inclusion of linking um, career options with academic um, advising. And only about 13% of, of, of students talk to career services staff about career options. Um, but a little bit more, around 20% or so, talk to their lecturers about career op op um, options. And the last data points are uh, the last data point on advising. Um, we asked students whether their career goals have stayed the same since they started at university. And you'll see there the first year students, 72% of them say, yes, my goals have stayed the same. Um, and then that takes a bit of a, a, a downturn. Only about 60% of students of senior students say that my career goals have stayed the same, which means that about 40% of senior undergraduate students at some stage change their mind where they want to be after they graduate. So what this brings us to the implications. What does this data mean for us as institutions um, in the Siapu Malela network? So first of all, we need to find ways to reach out to students for advising rather than waiting for them to come to us, especially our first year students. Um, the second bullet point there, academic advisors in faculties need to incorporate career links. There needs to be a link between academic advising and career advising um, for students. And there needs to be a focus, uh, 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 the focus of advising needs to be a bit broader than just module allocation especially in faculty. So in the top right uh, blue bubble there, um, most of you would know about the, the Academic Advising Professional Development short course that Gugu and her team um, at the UFS leads. Um, so far, they've trained over 200 um, professional advisors in, in South Africa, and it's also part of a service that is provided um, through the Siapu Malela network. Um, and in that course, in that professional development course, they focus on broadening the scope of academic advising um, to include things like career and the relationship building and goal setting and things like that, not just um, focusing on, on, on helping students choose which modules to take. Then the third bullet point, um, advisors need to be easily accessible to students, especially to first years. The, the probably the reason why they haven't made use of it is because they don't know it exists or they don't know how it works or who to ask or where to go. Um, and then lastly, getting students on the right path earlier from the first year, but keeping keep checking in with them in the in their senior years could also impact on throughput rates. So in the bottom right bubble there, you see that that is that is the norm about not even a third of our three year degree students graduate in minimum time and less than half uh, about 48 percent, I think, graduate in N plus one. So if our senior students, if 40% of our senior students change their mind about which careers they want to do, the chances are good that a lot of them are also changing their courses and they're staying in the system for a longer time. 
Okay, so for the next um, module is about inclusivity and decoloniality. We just added selected items in here. We'll have a more comprehensive um, report out, a national report out in the next couple of months or so. Um, but yes, just to highlight some of the key, key findings so long. So we asked, um, how much does your institution emphasize the following? And we had five institutions taking part in this module. Um, so how much does your institution emphasize creating an overall sense of community among students? Um, you'll see the red bars show that for the most part, um, about 65, let's say about two thirds to 70 percent of, stu of, of, of students in institutions say, yes, my institution does um, put in effort to create the sense of community among students. There's only one institution that stands out a bit. Um, we only about half of the students said, yes, um, I feel a sense of community or my, my institution um, um, put in some effort to um, to create the sense of community. Um, and the second one is um, the blue bars, ensuring that you are not stigmatized because of your identity. And then we list the whole range of social identities. Um, and again, you can see for the most part, students are quite positive about their institutions, allowing them um, freedom of social identities and, and protecting that. Um, then we ask students, to what extent do you disagree or uh, with the following, uh, agree or disagree with the following statements? I feel comfortable being myself at this institution. And we split these between first generation and, and second generation or not first generation students. Um, and you can see here that for the most part, um, up to 90% of students saying, yes, I do feel comfortable being myself at my institution. I feel valued by my institution. So 81% of first generation students saying, yes, I feel valued, but only 72, not but only, 72 is still okay, but we need to ask ourselves whether that is good enough. Um, of the, the second generation students saying, yes, I feel valued. Um, and then the last one, I feel like I'm part of the community at this institution. And 82% of the first generation students said, yes, I do. Um, and 73% um, of the second generation students say, that, um, yes, um, I do feel part of the community. Um, and we'll get back to this in the, in the significance part in a minute. So just around um, decoloniality, um, and this is split between first years and seniors. We ask students whether their module or subject work includes African and other developing countries theories and concepts, uh, whether their module or subject work is relevant to the challenges in the Southern African context, and whether the conversations in classrooms or online sessions allow different perspectives to be heard. Is it inclusive? And as you can see there, for the most part, in both um, first year and senior um, responses, this looks quite, um, quite promising. So just to recap, and, and particularly to focus on, on a sense of belonging, um, when, students, when students feel that they, that they belong, it is important to, to their retention. So in the same sample of 14,000 students, almost 40% of them say that, yes, I have considered dropping out of university. And for the most part, the main reasons have to do with, finan for, with finances. So um, previously, the, the main reason had to do with tuition fees. Now that there's more NASFAS funding, um, <clears throat> excuse me, now that there's more NASFAS funding, um, fees, uh, it's not necessarily tuition fees, but it's living costs, things like that. So, so money is still the main motivator for students wanting to drop out. However, if you look um, at the bubbles down below, <clears throat> excuse me, Almost half of students that say that they have considered dropping out said it was because they, they felt that they don't belong or they don't fit in, um, which is a bit more in the, in the bubble in the far right. Only 45% of, of, of students that say that they have considered dropping out say it was because of poor academic performance. So it's more important for students to, to have that sense of belonging than it is to, to um, um, or, or the weight of, of the sense of not having a sense of belonging is stronger than poor academic performance for them to consider dropping out. And this could be enhanced by a range of interventions, particularly through high impact practices and things like that, such as student societies or promoting day residences for off-campus students or engaging students in extracurricular activities um, or just by promoting a sense of care institutions so that students are aware of that um, as you as an institution actively promoting that. Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Hanli. I'll still um, navigate the slides from my side. Hanli?
Okay, so the next topical module that I will take you through is that of experiences with writing. Um, and we will show you a few highlights of these questions today. So in this first question, we ask students during the current academic year about how many papers of the following lengths have you been given to complete. And the responses here um, are shown for those who said that they've received at least one of the different sizes of papers. Um, in the actual survey, there are a range of options that students can choose from, but we've just summarized it here to give you a picture of the basic of students reported writing. So most students said that they've received at least one written task of up to five pages to complete. Almost three quarters received at least one paper of between six and 10 pages, and just over half of students have received a report or written task of 11 pages or more. Um, this amount of students who report that they have received um, these papers of varying lengths is significant if you consider how much time it takes students to do these written tasks. We ask these students on average, how long does it take you to complete these papers, reports or other written tasks of the different lengths? And in the graph, we show students who complete a specific length of paper in less than 10 hours versus those who complete that paper in more than 10 hours. So you'll see in the red bars, almost 70% of students said that when I write a paper of up to five pages, it takes me less than 10 hours, but almost a third did say that it takes me more than 10 hours to write such a paper. Then you can see how the time spent increases for the longer size of papers, with more than half of students saying I spend 10 hours or more to write a paper of between six and 10 pages. And of course, almost 70% spends this amount of time when they write papers of 11 pages or more. So even though we want students to write and complete these written tasks, it is just worth considering the significant amount of time and effort each of these papers takes students to do. We also ask students during the current academic year, which of the following types of writing have you done? And here we show you the results by different SESM categories that we use in SASE. Since different universities have different faculties, we cannot have one set of options regarding students' field of study in the SASE that we can apply nationally. Therefore, as a proxy for faculties, we use these SESM categories of the fields of business, education, human and social sciences, and science, engineering, and technology. So looking at the different types of writing then, most students from all fields of study do writing in assignments. Another type of writing that more or less the same amount of students across the fields do is that of short answer activities, with almost two thirds of students reporting on, on writing this. However, there are also some differences amongst the fields, such as students in the field of uh, science, engineering and technology, reporting that they write much more general reports and lab reports than other fields of study. On the other hand, they then engage much less in essay writing, writing for case studies and reflective writing, which can make the case that a greater variety of writing within fields of study might be necessary. In previous studies with UFS data, we found that writing is a predictor for students developing more higher order learning skills as, as measured in SASE. And so to make the link between higher order learning and written tasks, we ask students during the current academic year for how many written assignments have they analyzed something they read, argued the position using evidence, and for how many written assignments have they written in the style of a specific field. The results here are split between first years and seniors, and for those who reported that they did this for at least some written assignments. There are not much difference between first years and seniors for the first two questions, where most of them said that they analyzed something they read and argued the position using evidence for at least some written assignments. However, there's more of a difference between first years and seniors on writing in the style of a specific field, where more seniors reported doing this in at least some written assignments. So as they specialize more in their subjects, they start doing writing more specifically for these fields. Since we previously found writing to influence higher order learning, we looked at the items for this topical model also in relation to higher order learning, as well as another indicator measured on SASE reflective and integrative learning. By doing a logistic regression, we found that writing correlates significantly with these indicators, and those who reported doing more writing and reading through their experiences with writing module scored 14% higher on higher order learning and 16% higher on reflective and integrative learning. So if writing is so important in order to develop these skills in students, some key questions emerge from the data. We need to promote writing, but how do we balance the time and effort that goes into these assignments, especially the pressure on lecturers to provide feedback with the benefit of writing? It's something of a catch 22 and prompts one to think more innovatively about incorporating writing into students' assignments. Looking to the student side also, the more they write, the more time it takes and lecturers have to take into consideration that their module is not the only one that students are doing. 
So perhaps written assignments can be part of programmatic planning where they are spread out across modules to balance students' time with the benefit of writing as well. Also, if writing is important in developing higher order learning and reflective and integrative learning skills, should certain fields of study promote more variety and expose students to different types of writing? These are questions that need further exploration, and we hope to spark some thinking amongst CI institutions on students' experiences with writing as well. And then the last topical module that we have is that of learning with technology. We will again only highlight a few of, um, of these questions today. The first one that we will look at is during the current academic year, how much has students' use of technology contributed to them um, learning module work on their own and with other students? And how much has technology distracted them from completing their module or subject work? The results of those who say that this has happened quite a bit and very much are shown here by first years and seniors. Most students say that technology has contributed to them studying subject work on their own. Although many students reported their use of technology contributed to their completing of module work with other students, group work in face-to-face -face classes was still higher than this. We know from the Salium data that we did in 2020, um, peer learning having to occur online was a problem in emergency remote teaching and learning. Then, although less students reported on technology contributed to, contributing to the last question, Still almost half of students said that technology distracted them from completing their subject work quite a bit and very much. So their use of technology for completing work can be either good or bad. We had examples of this in the Salium data as well, where students said that they would go on YouTube to find help with a certain aspect of their work, but then they would see something interesting and before they know it, they are down the rabbit hole and looking at random videos. <laughs> so technology mostly contributing to learning as a support, but then also as a distraction sometimes. And me, you've got five minutes. Thanks, Wendy. Then we asked the students, how much does your institution emphasize teaching with technologies, providing technology and teaching you how to use available technologies to help you learn and providing support services to assist you with your use of technology? Again, those who said this happened quite a bit and very much are shown here with the differences between first years and seniors. Most students said that the institutions emphasize teaching with technologies, providing technology and teaching them how to use it to help them learn module work. Um, or around three quarters also said that the institution provided support services to assist them with their use of technology. However, for all these items, you can see that senior students are scoring lower than first years, first years especially on the support services they receive. This might show that institutions provide more support to first years, thinking that senior students are okay, or it could be that seniors themselves assume that they know what is necessary and don't see support that the institution is providing to them. However, they, they are only, these are only possible explanations of the data and there might be other interpretations as well. Another question that we asked is during the current academic year, to what extent has your skill level in the use of um, all of these aspects uh, been improved? First year and senior students um, who said it improved quite a bit and very much are shown here. Most reported that their skill level in all of these areas has been improved. In the Salium data um, that was administered in June 2020, students said that they feel they actually need more skills in technology. So it is then quite heartening to see that a year later, when this was administered at the end of 2021, more students have now improved their skill level in technology. And maybe just something to point out on the use of external websites to support learning is the issue of plagiarism and concerns raised around this. So although students now have good skills on using these external websites, there might still be interventions necessary in the correct use of these. And this can actually be mentioned for all of these areas of technology, um, as this is just baseline data and we don't know by how much student skills improved. Um, so this doesn't necessarily mean that students are now, di now digitally literate. They do, however, feel that their skill levels are improving. Um, we also asked them in general to what extent has the um, digital learning experience given them access, um, provided them with activities to encourage them and um, other aspects of, of effective teaching practices. Um, and just to give you a context again, in the Salium survey, we asked similar questions of students and then about two thirds of them um, said their digital experience included these aspects of quality. Um, so considering that that was in the beginning of remote teaching and learning, it wasn't bad that two thirds reported that, but in comparison with the Salium data, then the sample scored much higher, um, which is good to see. Um, in the sake of time, I think I'm going, just going to go faster over this. Um, 
So you'll see here that most most um, first years and seniors um, said their digital teaching and learning um, experience um, gave them access to different to contents. It provided activities to um, but that encouraged them. It based activities and it provided clear instructions and required them to complete and submit assignments. So some implications from the data for CR institutions again. Um, if we know that peer learning were happening less in emergency remote learning and teaching, how do we promote this in a more structured blended um, learning and teaching context? Um, we also saw that less senior students reported that their institutions emphasize support for using technologies. So we need to consider whether we are providing not only appropriate access to technologies, but also supporting these students on how to use the technologies. Um, and then just quickly two last items that I want to show you, um, the, the items that we um, put in as high impact practices. Um, so this is um, as institutions, some institutions already have them and some are developing them. Um, so here you can see the practice on entrepreneurial skills and many students still planning to be in, um, involved in this. Um, so are we um, providing students with opportunities to do this? And lastly, um, just the high impact practice on mental health. And here you can see that um, very few students um, are not aware of these practices. So quite good news that students are aware that these practices are available um, at their campuses. Okay, thank you very much that I, sorry that I had to ramble over that, but that, that is it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sonia and, and Honni. I see that you've been progressively answering questions in the chat. So um, and I think that that's um, a good thing. So no one is sort of left behind. There was a question there about which universities participated in the survey, but I assume as you did not name them, but numbered them that in fact, um, you don't want to share this information. Um, Wendy, there were, were about 10 universities that participated. We can put that in the chat if you want it. Um, we, we just didn't um, identify them in the different um, modules that they that they did um, to, to identify the different results that we were reporting on. Um, but we can say who were the module, or who were the universities who participated in the different modules. Um, but I can maybe just put that in the chat. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Um... I just want to see there's a couple of new comments. Um, now I think this is just people complimenting you and I would like to thank you as well. It was extremely interesting and always interesting to me to see with these SASU reports the difference between the first years and the senior students. Thank you all very much for being here. We've had very good attendance at this particular breakaway. Um, set of sessions. We will resume um, at three again. And um, I think we're ending the day with, with a presentation from Paul Moses, as he will obviously not be there for the closing tomorrow morning. So um, thank you all very much. And thank you to the um, people who've been supporting in the background, technically, and to Fry for um, standing in as the safety support person. Thank you very much, guys. Have a nice break until three. Catch up on all your emails, etc. Thank you, bye. Wendy. Thanks, Thank Wendy. Thanks, and bye.